busy sidewalks, busy sidewalks, dressed in holiday style. In the air, there's a feeling of Christmas. Children laughing, people passing, meeting smile after smile, and on every street corner you hear silver bells, silver bells, silver bells, silver bells. It's Christmas time in the city. Ring a ling, ring a ling. Hear them ring, hear them ring. Soon it will be Christmas Day. Strings of street lights, even stop lights, blink a bright red and green as the shoppers rush home with their treasures. Hear the snow. Silver bells, silver bells, silver bells, silver bells. It's Christmas time in the city. Ring a ling, ring a ling. Hear them ring, hear them ring. So.
had this happen? You think you are communicating clearly, when in reality what you are saying ends up creating conflict in your relationships. What we say is not what someone else really heard. This is about understanding people to the core. Figuring out what you said and what they heard and eliminating this gray area in between. By you understanding your authentic wiring, you'll become the very best version of yourself. What we will be learning about is temperaments, which is the why behind your personality. Beginning January 3rd at West Church, we are going to dive into a message series, That Is Not What I Said. We are going to learn about our different personalities and what makes us tick. We will also learn how to better relate to one another. Based off a book, I Said This, You Heard That by Kathleen Edelman, we will improve our relationships and learn to be our best selves in the light of faith. Remember, our strengths and weaknesses are choices. We're going to recreate real-life situations and conflicts. Learning the temperaments will change everything. All of your relationships, every decision you make, and every word you speak. This is going to be a fun journey. Merry Christmas. We are so glad that you have chosen this evening to take your time and your sacred time. And I know you have a lot going on tonight. And so thank you for joining in with us for this Christmas Eve service. Or if you're worshiping with us uh, in the days after Christmas Eve, we hope that you find this Christmas Eve service and message meaningful and relevant for you in your lives during this COVID pandemic. Who would have known that we would be in still in this space and this time uh, so many months ago. If you are newer to the West Church community, we are so grateful that you have chosen to check us out. We would love to know that you are worshiping with us. We have a free gift for you. And so if you would text the word welcome to the number that you see on your screen, 704 343 
704-343-8955. If you would text the word welcome to that number, we won't inundate you with a bunch of stuff, but we will send you a free gift and just uh, one welcome email and let you know what we're about. And then you can choose to continue to check us out or not. We have some exciting things that are coming in the new year. So I hope you'll give West a chance. Tonight, we are going to talk about the message that comes in the meaning of Christmas, that uh, there is something that can help us conquer our fears. And so I'm so grateful that you've chosen to be a part of worship this evening. There's a couple of uh, logistical things we want to invite you to do. One is if you have a candle sitting around your house this evening, I invite you to go get that, a lighter, and have that nearby. You can go in and light it if you want to, or at the end of the service, our worship team is going to lead us in silent night. And so I'm going to invite you to dim your lights and, and just concentrate on that candle and the message that comes to all of us, the message that light permeates all of the darkness. And so we will do that during the song Silent Night. So I invite you to go do that, or you can use your flashlight on your cell phone, whatever uh, source of light you want to receive tonight. But I do hope you'll participate in that part of the service. The other part is the sacrament of Holy Communion. In the United Methodist Church, we believe that communion and the table of communion is open to absolutely everyone. There aren't any rules or regulations or, or church dogma around who can receive communion. So I invite you to go find some crackers or bread or some kind of substance that you can take and break and then dip into some juice or some wine, whatever you have handy. And then again, later on in the service, after the message, we're going to invite you to partake of Holy Communion together with us. We are so grateful that you are here. I know that there are infinite numbers of churches that you could choose to spend your time with this evening. We are grateful that you have chosen this one. So uh, let us worship together.
newborn A newborn king to see Pa-rum-pum-pum-pum pum, pum, pum. Our finest gifts we bring Pa-rum-pum-pum-pum To lay before the king Pa-rum-pum-pum-pum Rum-pum-pum-pum Rum-pum-pum-pum So to honor him Pa-rum-pum-pum-pum when we come hey, 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 hey. Little baby Pa-rum-pum-pum-pum I am a poor boy too Pa-rum-pum-pum-pum Gifts to bring power up pum 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 That's fit to give a king power up pum 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 Rum pum 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 Rum pum 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 Shall I play for you a rum pum 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 On my track Unafraid, Adam Hamilton tells a story about one of his clergy friends and a bedtime ritual that he had with his son. Every night when they would get ready to go to bed, he would tuck his son in, they'd say his prayers, and, and then he, they would go their separate ways. He'd leave his son in his bedroom and he'd go do whatever else it was he needed to do before he would finish going to bed. After a little while, a pattern started to develop, and his son would have bad dreams or nightmares, and when he would, he would not soothe himself back to sleep. He'd actually get up and go into his dad and mom's bedroom, and he'd wake up his dad and want his dad to come back and sleep with him. Now, the dad did that for a while, but then after a while, it started to, to wear thin, and he was exhausted, and so one night when he went back into his son's room, he's like, look, 
you don't need to be afraid. Remember Jesus, we we pray to God and we know that Jesus loves you. You know that. So when you wake up, I want you to remember Jesus loves you and you don't need to be afraid. The response that his son had is a response that I think you and I have a lot in our lives We love this concept of God and love and God's presence and God's peace and hope and joy and love. But sometimes when we are in the middle of our own nightmares and our own fears, it feels like God isn't there at all. And that's the response that this man's son gave. And it's a response that I think we give too. And it's actually one of the messages that we are going to explore tonight in the Christmas story. When his dad said that, you know, hey, just remember, Jesus loves you. The son replied, yes, daddy, I know that Jesus loves me. But when I am afraid, I need someone with some skin. Isn't that how we feel when we are facing our fears? I mean, these big promises that come from God, they're great. But sometimes we need a little more than just some big promises. We need to know that God has some skin. That's the message of the Christmas story. One of the aspects of the story that we're going to talk about tonight is the fact that God shows up. And God takes on human form. And God has skin. And that message of hope that came a couple of thousand years ago, that message is still real for you and I today. And and that's a message that we can cling to. That message is not just proven in like the Christmas story in the four Gospels. It's talked about in the book of Isaiah too, but maybe in a different context than perhaps we've understood. Like there are some Bible verses in Isaiah that say, for unto you is going to be born a, a son of a virgin. And, and we always assume, right, that maybe Isaiah is talking about Jesus. But actually, th- this story is so much bigger than that. And it's a powerful reminder that God does indeed put skin on. So this evening, we're going to talk a little bit about this story that happened to the Israelite people that's recorded in Kings and Chronicles and then the verses we're going to read from Isaiah. And then we're going to look at a few verses from the book of Matthew, the more traditional Christmas story. But my hope is by the end of this message and our time together that we can see a pattern, that we can see a sign, that God shows up for God's people and God puts some skin on. And then hopefully we will see that, embrace it, and hear it as a call to action for us and our own lives. So I want you to like take a look at this historical story with me. Take a look at the map you're going to see on your screen. On this map, you'll see uh, lots of different colors and they outline all the different kingdoms that were present back then. There were so many and, and each kingdom had their own king and had their own ruler. And some were friendly, some were not. Uh, the two stars that you see on your screen, the top one, that is the kingdom of Israel. And the capital of the northern kingdom was Samaria. And then if you look down on the lower half of your screen, you're going to see the southern kingdom. And this kingdom of Israel was called Judah. And the capital of Judah was Jerusalem. Now, all of this land is what we refer to today as the Holy Land. But uh, for tonight, I want you to look at these two particular kingdoms. Now, these were still a part of like one big family. Even though they had two different kings and, and they were from two different tribes, they still got along. Now, north of that, and in the next picture that you see, you're going to see the kingdom of Aram. Now, this was not a part of the Israel kingdom, but they were still pretty friendly with each other. They, everybody just basically minded their own business. 
So you have this kingdom of Aram, and, and the capital of it was Damascus. And it's really important, I want you to pay close attention to the picture that you see right now and how they're all, how they're all geographically laid out. The geopolitical things that were going on in this climate back then in 732 BC, they're so important because they give us meaning for today. Now look on your screen at the very top uh, before the kingdom of Aram, up above that, you see the words Assyrian Empire. And now take a look at this image. All the green, the dark green is what the Assyrian Empire looked like in 824 BC. And you see that it is this vast area. But then if you look a little closer, you'll notice that there are two different shades of green and there's a lighter green. So you had this one mass in 824 BC and then you have a much bigger geographical area that had been conquered by the Assyrians by 671. That's really important to this story. And I don't mean to bore you with a bunch of history tonight. It's just that I want us to see that whether you buy the whole Christmas narrative or not, whether you believe in the virgin birth and all that kind of stuff, there are messages that we can find in the message of Christmas and the message of God and the message of love that can carry us and, and be relatable to us as human beings today. I mean, hey, we're still in the middle of this pandemic. And even though the vaccine is starting to be rolled out, you know, I saw on the news the other day that in the United Kingdom, they're shutting it down again because it seems that there's a different strain. When I saw that, I literally just thought, is it ever going to end? I imagine that many of you feel that way too. Like, is our, is our existence ever going to go back to what was normal? And the answer to that probably is no. I mean, there will be a new normal, but we still don't even have a firm grasp of when we're going to be able to fully embrace that. I think we're discouraged, right, as a group of people, and, and we are afraid. And so that's why tonight in the Christmas story, I wanted us to look at the theme of fear and how we are afraid sometimes, and, or maybe lots of times, our ancestors were afraid, but that there is a hope and a promise that confronts our fears, and that actually has something to do with this history lesson and this map. Before we take the map completely away, I want you to notice one more thing. You see all the green on your screen? That's the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians, I mean, they were powerful, powerful people. And back in 834, before they started taking over all the land, I mean, people were afraid of them. And remember the northern and southern uh, kingdoms of Israel? They ended up becoming very divided. And I'm a, that's part of our story. But before we get to that, take a look at that tiny little part in the middle of all the green, the yellow, where it says Judah. That's your visual reminder and your visual example that God is a God with some skin. So now let me tell you the story. You have the northern and the southern tribe of Israel. The, and they, like I told you, they got along, okay? But they each had their own king. And then you had the kingdom of Aram, and, and that had its own king. And, and these three kingdoms, they were living in fear of the Assyrians. And you see why, right? Like they had all the territory, and, and they were an oppressive, oppressive governmental regime, and how they would manipulate the other kingdoms is they would charge them taxes. And they would say, look, if you want us to leave you alone and not come in and conquer you and, and take your people captive, then you have to pay us. If you pay us a certain amount, then fine, we're going to leave you alone. But if you don't pay us, then it's fair game. And whenever that message would come to a king and his kingdom, they knew that they had to pay the taxes because there was no way that these smaller territories were ever going to be able to stand up to the Assyrian kingdom and empire. 
Well, after some time of this oppression, the smaller kingdoms, those three that I talked about, the northern and the southern and the kingdom of Aram, they got to talking and they're like, you know, what if us smaller kingdoms like band together? And what if we stood together and took on the Assyrian Empire? Now, the kingdom of Aram said, all right, we're in. The northern kingdom of Israel with the capital in Samaria, they were like, all right, we're in. And they approached the southern kingdom of Judah, and they're like, no way, have you lost your mind? The Assyrians are so much bigger than even the three of us together. If we try to conquer the Assyrians, we are never, ever going to win. Now, the king of this southern tribe, his name was Ahaz. And he is a pivotal part of this story. It's my hope that maybe we can see ourselves in Ahaz and then receive the same promise that he received. I want you to take a look and listen to these words from the book of Isaiah. During the time that Ahaz, son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, was king of Judah, King Rezin of Aram and King Pekah of Israel attacked Jerusalem, but the attack sputtered out. When the Davidic government learned that Aram had joined forces with Ephraim, that is Israel, Ahaz and his people were badly shaken. They shook like trees in the wind. So we have Ahaz, and he's the one who's like, no, I am not going to join forces with you two to try to conquer the Assyrian Empire. I just, I don't think that's the right thing to do. I think we will lose. We'll lose our freedom. And so he we read in Isaiah, was shaken so badly, especially when he learned the outcome of their battle, that he and his heart, it shook like trees in the wind. Can you remember a time, or maybe it's now that you were that afraid, that uh, fear stopped you in your tracks? And you were paralyzed and didn't know how to proceed. Well, that's what was happening to Ahaz. He was crippled with his fear. But he does something. So take a look at these verses. He goes to Isaiah, and Isaiah's a prophet, and Isaiah tells him, I want you to listen to this government of David. It's bad enough that you make people tired with your pious, timid hypocrisies. But now, you're making God tired. So the master is going to give you a sign anyway. Watch for this. A girl who is presently a virgin, she's going to get pregnant, and she's going to bear a son and name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. By the time the child is 12 years old, able to make moral decisions, the threat of war is going to be over. Relax. Those two kings that have you so worried, they're going to be out of the picture. You know what was going to happen, actually, is that like when Ahaz opposed the northern kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Aram, they like got together and decided on their own that, hey, you know what? We're going to take him over first. We're going to attack him. He's not going to play by our rules and come along with our attempted coup. Then fine. We're going to take him over and then we're going to go conquer the Assyrians. Now, when Ahaz heard that, I mean, he was legitimately so afraid. 
Not only is he afraid of the Assyrians, but now he's afraid of the other two kingdoms coming together to try to take him over. And that's where we see him interact with Isaiah. And there's a lot more verses in this passage, and and they're beautiful because once Ahaz admits his fear and owns that he is afraid and he has no idea how to move forward, we find that he gets an answer. The same thing that happened to Ahaz happens to us. It just takes action on our parts. It takes humility and our willingness to admit that we are afraid and and we don't know where to turn or how to go. The really even more powerful part of this story is that Ahaz was really a douchebag. I mean, he was the worst king. He was not like this devout guy that was sitting around, you know, uh, worshiping God. And, and you can go on and read in Second Kings and Chronicles just exactly how bad this guy was. In fact, he would sacrifice his own children in Gehenna. And Gehenna is the name for hell. It's the valley where they would, it was like the local trash dump. And they would go and sacrifice animals and humans. And that's where we get those New Testament verses. The, you hear the weeping and the gnashing of teeth, and that is hell. It is. It's the valley of death. It's Gehenna. And Ahaz, he was such a jerk, he would like sacrifice his own children. He was a ruthless leader. But at one point, he had like this connection to, to God but he got distracted by his own stuff, maybe by his ego and pride, who knows, and he drifted away from God. And so when obstacles and hurdles and fears confronted him, he had nowhere to go, and he didn't know what to do. And so Isaiah comes in, and he's like, look, God loves you. God's here. God is ever-present, and all you have to do is believe that God is with you. And Ahaz is like, "Mm mm-mm, no, no. And that's why we see Isaiah saying, you know, I am so tired of you and your hypocrisies and your disbelief, and, and God's tired of it too. But even though God is tired, God's still with you. Now remember, this is their understanding of God, right? Like we know that God doesn't get tired of our hypocrisies and stuff, that God is ever present and we believe in grace and God is urging us and pulling us to be in the presence of God even when we mess up over and over again. But it is up to us, right, to live into that presence and to to be fully present in the promises and power and presence of God. So Ahaz... Here's Isaiah, and Isaiah goes on to say, so a son is going to be born, and this son is going to be your sign. You know that old adage, here's your sign, this is your sign. A son's going to be born to what is now a virgin. Now, scholars argue about who the virgin was in this passage. Some have said Isaiah, but the majority of scholars agree that this was one of Ahaz's youngest wives. And little did they know, soon they found out she was pregnant. And nine months later, she gave birth to a son Isaiah told Ahaz to name the son Emmanuel, which means God is with us. God is with you. So Ahaz, every time your fears cripple you and every time your fears stop you in your tracks, look at your son and remember that God is with you. God has some skin on Remember the picture that I showed you with all the green and just the tiny little bit of yellow? That's how it ended up. A couple hundred years later, that little bit of yellow, that's actually Ahaz's kingdom. Because what he did was he sent word to the Assyrians And he's like, look, I'm scared. 
these two other kingdoms, they are getting ready to try to overthrow you. But before they do that, they're going to take me out. And I'm frightened and afraid. So he ended up joining alliances with the Assyrian Empire and kingdom. And at the end of the day, his kingdom stayed intact. It's a beautiful story of how God gives a sign when we are in the middle of our fear and uncertainty and it looks like we might lose it all. We just have to look and we have to listen. We have to know that God is ever-present and God does give us signs. Prior to like studying scripture in a preacher context, I always assumed that that passage in Isaiah was about Jesus. It is, somewhat. But it's also about the historical context and narrative that was happening back in the 800s and 700s and 600 B.C. Matthew, the gospel writer Matthew, who tells us, you know, uh, his version of the Christmas story. Did you know that he's actually where we get the name Jesus is Emmanuel? Because see, what happens is like, you know, hundreds of years later, there's another baby boy born. After the people had been in captive for hundreds of years and no prophet had spoken a message of hope for hundreds of years. And then all of a sudden, there's like a lot of conversation and a lot of energy and a lot of things happening around this little boy that was born in Bethlehem to this woman named Mary and to this man named Joseph. And angels appeared to different people, telling them, hey, this is going to happen. And then when it did happen, they continued to appear and said, hey, go, take a look. And then, like 70 AD, Matthew writes these words. This is about Joseph. While he was trying to figure a way out of this engagement to Mary, because he found out that she was going to have a baby, Joseph had a dream. God's angel spoke into the dream. Joseph, son of David, don't hesitate to get married. Mary's pregnancy is spirit-conceived. God's Holy Spirit has made her pregnant. She will bring a son to birth. And when she does, you, Joseph, you will name him Jesus. God saves because he will save his people from their sins, and the times they miss the mark of living out love. This would bring the prophet's embryonic sermon, they're talking about Isaiah, to full term. Watch for this. A virgin will get pregnant and bear a son. They will name him Emmanuel, Hebrew, for God with us. The beautiful part of the second half of the story is that, you know, Matthew's not just quoting Isaiah. Matthew saw. He was there when Jesus, when this, this person, Jesus of Nazareth, fully human, Matthew was there and he saw him live and he saw him love. He saw him be able to have this just innate peace when he faced all kinds of of being ostracized and people angry and ridicule and ultimately crucifying him, killing him. Matthew saw all that. Matthew also experienced a resurrected Jesus. And Matthew knew that the prophecy had been fulfilled, that God was indeed that ultimate love and ultimate grace It was fulfilled. It was real. God had skin on in the person of Jesus. And because God has some skin on, 
They didn't need to be afraid because Jesus gives us this message that it is my hope that as your pastor, it's the one thing I want you to remember that I drill in us every time is that the worst things are never the last things. Jesus lived through some pretty worst things. But the last things Jesus shows us are the most beautiful things. And that's the message of hope and peace that comes to us in this Christmas season, that we don't need to be afraid. So how stressed out are you right now? And I don't mean just like uh, over the next few hours before you finish you know, Christmas and celebrate tomorrow, hopefully with some friends or some family. I mean your soul. How stressed out and how tired are you in your soul? You know, men call it stress, women call it worry. We tend to think the worst. It's called the thought of catastrophe, like when we're stressed or when we're anxious or when we're worried, we automatically go to the worst possible scenario. We go to the worst things. And we don't have to do that. So I wanted to give you just a few pointers tonight, a few ideas that we can hold on to that will help us remember that we don't have to hold on to those horrific things. First of all, there is this happiness U-curve. You know, one of the fears that we have as humans is getting older. And we fear like getting older and and not being able to live life to its fullest. You know, sociologists and psychologists have done hundreds of thousands of studies on human happiness. And they published this report. It's called the Happiness U-Curve. And if you see uh, on the left, you see life satisfaction ratings. And then across the bottom of the graph you see ages and you know at like ages 18 you see that it's about a seven and a half or seven and three quarters almost an eight and then as you get older your happiness decreases now why is that Uh, some will say that it's because you have children and although we love our children right that as they age they perhaps bring a whole new level of stress Uh, others say it's called adulting like you know we have to start paying our bills and we have to start managing all those adult things. But look what happens. Like after you hit 50, so see, I hit 50 a month ago. I have some hope that as we go on that uh, upward curve of years, our happiness increases. So guess what? We don't have to be afraid of getting older. Studies and research show that if people are in good health, that as, as they age, their happiness increases. Another thing that we are afraid of is violence. We talk so much about violence, and, and there is still so much in our society and in our world, and, and it needs to be confronted and addressed and lots of different ways of looking at that. But I wanted to show you another statistic, another screen. Do you know that our crime rates have fallen, actually, since the early 1990s? And the trends in United States violent crime and property crime is on a decline. You don't hear that in the news, right? And, you know, I think we need to admit something. The people in the culture that we live in, there are groups of people that want us to be afraid. Because it becomes a lucrative deal for them. Uh, newspapers used to have a slogan years and years ago, if it bleeds, it will read. So that's what you put on the front of the paper, or that's what you open the news with, the tragic story, if it bleeds, it will read. And what was their goal? To sell newspapers or to have their newscast be the predominant one watched. So we live in a culture that sort of wants us to feed own our fears. But research can show us some opposite trends. There are four different things, and I wish these were mine. They're not. I got them from Adam Hamilton in that book. But there are four different things and 
attitudes and actions we can apply to our lives to help us confront our fears. And this is what I wanted us to end with tonight. And the first part of them, it spells out the word fear, actually. So the first one is to face our fears with a bias of hope. Remember a few minutes ago when I said we have this thought of catastrophe, catastrophic thought, and, you know, we automatically go to the bad. But guess what? It takes just as much mental energy to think the bad as it does the good. So the next time that you start getting caught up in your fears and your brain and you start analyzing or you feel stressed out, what if you stop thinking all the bad and start thinking the good? I will pick on the West staff for just a minute because, frankly, I'm just so grateful to them, the, the staff that have been working so diligently to make all this happen. I mean, it's been a crazy season uh, trying to have Advent and, and a missional focus and Ding Dong Ditch and all those things and, and still, try, still try to have worship and music. And, and we're trying to do something in person, and we didn't know how that was going to work out. And I think the staff, some of them are having nightmares about what the uh, parking lot service might actually look like. I mean, they're only calling for, I don't know, 20, 30 degree winds or mile an hour winds, I mean, and torrential rain. So hmm, perhaps we should have a little fear, but it would be my hope for the staff that when they start thinking about all those fears that they come to the place and, and accept, you know what, I've done everything I could possibly do. I'm very human. I have given my best. And I believe that God will take my best and use it for the work of the kingdom. And if there are mistakes, there are going to be mistakes because we are a people of grace. We're a 10-year-old church and there have been lots of mistakes all the way down the line. Every Christmas Eve has had some colossal error typically on me. And you guys, some of you keep coming back. So we're, we're grateful. It takes just as much energy to think the negative as the positive. So why wouldn't we cling to thinking the positive? That changes things. So that's the first thing. The second thing that we should do is examine our fears in light of the facts. So what are the facts? We're afraid of violence. We'll look at the statistics. We're afraid of growing old. Look, people are happier the older they get. And that's why, you know, that statement that I, I say to us over and over again, I want us to get ingrained with the facts. Think about a time in your life that you were just absolutely afraid and then I want you to ask yourself, well, my fear, whatever I was afraid of, did it come true? Maybe it did. 94%, I think is what research shows, 94% of what we worry about never comes true. But there is that 6%. And frankly, some of the things that I've worried about have come true. But guess what? I'm still here. And that's that promise that Isaiah gave Ahaz and then Matthew gave a bigger picture of that the worst things are never the last things. That's a statement I want us to hold on to. The worst things are never the last things. So regardless of what our fears are, we can face them. The next thing that we do when we confront our fears is recognize and understand that we have to attack our anxieties with action. That's what Ahaz did when he found out those other two kingdoms, once he said, I'm not going to go in with you, when he found out that they were going to attack him, he decided that he was going to talk to the Assyrians. And guess what? They protected him. And then you saw that little yellow bubble there at the end. He stayed intact. He did something about it. Are you afraid of relationships failing or relationships changing? Then have conversations about it. Don't just sit there and ruminate on your fears. Are you afraid of, of financial problems? Then go find a financial advisor. However you feel trapped by your fears, recognize that you have the power within you to take action. And the last thing that we can do 
is to release our cares to God. You know, long before there was Wellbutrin or Zoloft or other medications, which I am not knocking, and at different seasons in my life have participated in them because I needed some medical help to conquer uh, my feelings of sadness and, and depression and fear. But long before there was that, there was something that people would rely on completely, and that was that power and presence of God. And that's the beautiful thing about Ahaz. He had really, you know, gotten sort of sidetracked from his relationship with God, but God doesn't move. And so no matter how bad our fears get in the way, they don't have to because God doesn't move. So meditation and prayer and worship and, and being a part of a community of, of people of faith, those are concrete things we can do to conquer our fears because they will help us release our cares to God. When I was 21, I had just started teaching my first adult career. I was teaching sixth grade in, in Claremont, North Carolina, lived in Hickory, and was living alone for the first time ever. And uh, it was this apartment building, and it was sort of like a gated community, sort of. I mean, like you had to have a key to get into the apartment complex, and my apartment was on the bottom floor. There was one night I was uh, studying, I was in grad school, I was studying before I went to bed, and I had fallen asleep while I was reading, and I woke up to hear voices outside my window. It was about 12.30 in the morning, and I, I heard some male voices, and I laid there for a minute, and then I heard someone say, I know she's in there. So I jumped off my bed and got down on the floor because I didn't want them to be able to see me. And back then I had, you know, those old kind of metal blinds and they were turned, you know, like so that you could. If you stood at the right angle, you would be able to see in my apartment bedroom. And uh, I heard them, so I got on the floor, I pulled the landline phone, if you don't know what that is, ask somebody older than you. Uh, I pulled the landline phone down on the floor and uh, I called my daddy. I'm like, Daddy, I think there are guys outside my window, and I don't know what to do. They're not going away. And he's like, well, have you called the police? And I'm like, well, no, I called you. And he's like, well, I am um, 30 minutes away, 45 minutes away. I think you should probably call the police and just tell them what's going on. And then uh, when you get off the phone, though, I want you to call me back. And I will stay with you on the phone until the police come. In between all this happening, I had slithered over next to the windowsill and looked out the bottom of the blind, and I could see uh, sets of feet there. And the feet weren't moving. I was probably the scaredest then that I had ever been uh, alive. I went back to the other side of the bed and I called my daddy back and he sat there like he said he would on the phone with me. Until the police showed up and they went outside first and I don't know if the people heard them coming or whatever, but they scattered and the voices went away. I will always, always, despite all the crap that sometimes, you know, you have in family relationships, I will always remember that that night in that moment, my daddy was God with some skin on. And that's the last part of this story. You see, uh, Ahaz's son, the baby boy born, Long before the time of Jesus, he was Emmanuel, God with some skin on. And then Jesus of Nazareth was born, and he ultimately became known as the Christ, which is not his last name. It meant anointed one, the Messiah. Jesus was God with some skin on. And then Jesus, before he left, he said, Look, my power that I have, it is with you and in you, far greater than I can think of and imagine. So you, people, you're called to be God with some skin on. 
as 2020 comes to a thank goodness end, our world more now than ever needs God with some skin on. If we will own and know that God gives us all that we need to conquer and live through our fears and that the worst things are never, ever the last things, we'll have all that we need to not only know that God has skin on in our lives, but then go be that for each other. May you go in that peace. I heard the bells on Christmas Day Their old familiar carols play And mild and sweet their songs repeat Of peace on earth, goodwill to men And the bells are ringing Peace on earth Like a choir they're singing Peace on earth And in my heart I hear them Peace on earth Goodwill to men And in despair about my head There is no peace on earth I said The hate is strong and mocks the song Of peace on earth goodwill to men And the bells are ringing
peace on earth and goodwill to all. That is the message of hope that we can cling to this Christmas season in knowing that God is a God with skin on. And God reveals God's self to us through the person and the life of Jesus. And guess what? Jesus knew what humanity was going to need. He knew that his life was coming to an end, and so he gave his followers and he gives us this message of hope that can abide in us and carry us every step of our journey. They were gathered together in the upper room, and and it was the night before Jesus' trial, his arrest and his trial, and they were having the Passover meal, but Jesus gave it new meaning. And I invite you to receive that meaning This evening, he took the bread and he broke it. He gave thanks to God. And then he said, this is my body and it is broken for you. Every time you eat of this, I want you to do it and I want you to remember me. And then he took the cup. He gave thanks to God. He asked for forgiveness of their sins. And he said, I want you to drink of this all of you. This is my blood that is poured out for you. This is a new covenant that is not just written in law books, but written on your hearts. This blood is shed for you for forgiveness of your sins. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, will you pour out your spirit on this bread and on this cup? Make it be for us your body and your blood shed for us so that we may know and see, embrace and cling to the hope that we have a God with skin on and that God with skin on carries us in and through all things. God, we know that you are ever present in our lives and the worst things are not the last things. Forgive us of the times that we fall short of being a people of love, when we forget to love ourselves, and when we forget to offer your love to all of humanity. God, forgive us of those times. That's our sin. And then until we are united completely at one with you and all of the universe, God, carry us. Make this be for us, you, in our lives on this Christmas. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I invite you to take your bread or your cracker and then take your cup. This is the body of Christ that is broken for you. And this is the cup of the new covenant that is poured out for you and for all for forgiveness of our sins. In just a second, the worship team is going to sing Silent Night. I invite you to turn your lights down and have a candle or use your personal cellular device and turn the flashlight on and just sit amidst the darkness and notice that as they sing this song, the light, it permeates the darkness. That is a light of hope, of love, of joy, and of peace. Take a listen. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round yon virgin
Emmanuel is God with us. God has been present with humanity from the beginning of time. There are so many examples of it through Ahaz and his son, through Jesus, and through the way that we love each other. On this Christmas Eve, may we go and may we know that we are able to be a people not of fear, but a people of peace. And may we know that God does have skin on. We can go be God with skin on. And may we always come back to the foundation of knowing that because of that, the worst things are never the last things and the last things are the most absolute beautiful things. Go in the peace of Christmas. Merry Christmas. Mm -hmm.